starting and having this conversation, right? And you guys uh, starting a discussion with the people around you is fantastic. Um, the <coughs> games are never going to move forward without all of you having this conversation, reading this conversation to friends, to parents, to, to everyone you see. Um, so I don't want it to be about us. Um, and I saw a question back there? Uh, yes. Um, it's pretty much a really, uh, not really actually a death question. It's <coughs> more like from the sales side. Do you think that uh, the consoles, uh, you know, the Sony, you know, all that type of stuff, is that, is that going to be going away anytime soon? Or is it just like, you know, what people are saying that PCs would get back in the ground and the and such? So, uh, anyone can jump in. Like terribly long speaking, some people can't record computers that are that fancy and don't believe in it. You've got a lot of historical uh, attachment to Nintendo. I mean, look at all the Mario's you see out there, all the classics. The classics have always been consoles. People love consoles, they have attached meaning to them. And when you have established market and established meaning to say, hey, I want to you know, throw all that away and switch off the computers. Computers are sterile, they don't have that whole brand attachment. I mean, we got like the Asus and the uh, the new things coming about, but they don't have that kind of long-standing emotional attachment that uh, consoles do. But so you also have a problem, like, I know personally, when the Wii U came out, I thought it was, I control it just for the Wii. Yeah. A lot of the, a lot of these companies aren't marketing things the way to where people are wanting consoles now. They're wanting things that they can just, like, have there that has more horsepower. Because even the Switch right now, like, if you just look at the Nintendo Switch, it doesn't look like it has a lot of horsepower. Which is already turning a lot of people off. Well, there are some people that doesn't matter. Also, it's a Nintendo product. Like we don't, we're not expecting power from a Nintendo product. <laughs> what about Nintendo power? Crazy. Let's see. I think that's the problem. Is that it's not a Nintendo product. You have a room you have your TV in. And we have sort of seen with the uh, Steam box. People are not as interested in that being a PC with all that gas and other things we have. Um, that said, right now we've got an upgraded version of the PS4. In 10 years, we may be playing the PS4 Mega, which is they're claiming it's still a PS4, but we're secretly upgrading it every year. Xbox um, One, two. Scorpio. <laughs> I'll also say that the business of making games is still very, very firmly entrenched in the console model, uh, as particularly in some part because of Steam's dominance in the PC market. There's um, people don't necessarily want to compete on PC because you have to be on Steam and then they'll get that. Uh, so, um, so I'd say there's definitely still viability for consoles. I would say there is less viability in the long term for physical discs. And people have been saying that forever. But, but what markets do you think GMT is? Are they starting to impact the Can I interject with the, 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 the Steam comment? I mean, if, if you're in a console world, well, similar to the way you're. Uh, <coughs> The way Valve is getting some uh, some of your money, money. If you're if you're publishing to the Xbox, uh, Microsoft's getting some of your money, and if you're publishing to the PS4, Sony's getting, or my, uh, uh, I'm sorry, or Nintendo's getting. I mean, Steam, it's it's the same. You're you're paying the same basic tax regardless of system. Why is Steam any different from any of the console? If that's the risk you're paying, you're paying the tax. Yeah. 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 Also, yeah. at the same time, the digital libraries, some systems like. If you lose your account, it's gone. You can't tie it to another system. That's because you're buying the licenses instead of the actual yeah. copy of the game. Yeah. But like with PC though, like the Steam game, you get a new computer, you can re-download those games. But you go from a PS3 to a PS4, if you have digital games, they're gone. Well, what if Steam is stops? What if Valve is just like, we're done? Yeah. 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 We're tired of money. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like three is coming out. When I said yeah. it's yeah. true, I also didn't know about the series. Yeah. 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 Um, the publishers have yeah. yeah. kind of yeah. really good relationships with Microsoft. Yeah. Microsoft yeah. 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 Uh, and they, they'll put our <laughs> budget behind the AAA games that they think are going to you know, and move, to system, move consoles. And the relationship issues, it also is a matter of knowing who you talk to to get what you've done, which is a real 
the infrastructure, time, investment thing, which people don't want to have to be like, well, if I want to do it on this different platform or this different style, I need to learn all the appropriate names, their contact info, and how to get them to do what I want them to do. Correct. Would you box? That is a good uh, right. and that relationship is, not there. Probably. And that's a very good solution thing. It's a business thing that we actually. Yeah, yeah. is it is it a business thing or is it a consumer thing or is it a cultural thing that seems to uh, crave uh, closed system environments? Well, I think one more important is always a use case for you know living room, big TV, couch gaming. As long as that exists, I think console will continue to exist. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think at the end of the day, from, yeah. from a hardware right. point of view, uh, a console is just a PC now. Uh, I think that's the more and more it has that Microsoft moves Windows 10 closer and closer to this universal platform. Right, so what's. what's We're going to see the Xbox is a Windows. What, yeah, what's the opposite side of this coin? At what point do we start seeing PCs that are just like, no, it can only game? See, at the core, like, it's all, all these consoles, consoles, they're all. Computers. There's not really a, a huge difference outside of the architecture from a programming they accept. The really important thing, the reason why we're probably never going to see consoles ever go truly away, um, and not to say there couldn't be an answer for it on the PC side, but it's universal plug and play. It's we just want it to work. We don't want to have to download drivers, we don't want to have to check out what framework we're doing that now. Yeah, you know, yeah. does all this stuff with thin clients, nothing more than streaming. And we had almost a generation where online and a few other services try to use cloud computing to, to, to all the drivers, all the hardware, all the cloud, streaming directly to your device. That didn't take off. But maybe that will be the future in another you know, 10 to 15 years when the, when the cycle changes again. I highly, highly doubt that. Yeah. Okay. I, I think, the I speed think of light is not going to get faster no matter what kind of I think there's more and more push right. out further. But but yeah, but I think in terms of streaming, it might get there. Like, it's easier to upgrade. Then, like, if it's constantly easier to upgrade, you're like, oh, I don't have enough power, I can go out and buy my part and upgrade it compared to, like, you go inside, you can't expand the memory, it's 32 gigs, that's it. I can literally YouTube talk to you and get an adapter, and if you don't have to upgrade it myself, it's easier. But a lot of people don't have the average. I mean, like, with the whole computer thing, though, all of us, all of us probably know how to build a computer, or at least have some knowledge of that. People that are just want, people that just want the next console, they probably don't know that. I think you're gonna buy the Switch. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> We have a second, a second question. A second question. <laughs> Remember last time we talked about the Steam piston, and you were wondering about like to get the idea that Steam was promising. I'm wondering if promise a portable, like actual portable Steam console that allows you to handheld that has actually plays high up games. And with the Switch big announcement, basically, it is something like that. What is your opinion between the piston and this, like, the idea, the idea of the piston and this middle of the Switch thing? Like, the idea, like, basically, console games of, of that scale could be basically like, be portable and all that stuff. So, it's just different library, right? What it kind of got me excited about the 
PC library transferring to portable, is there actually a number of PC games that are already in existence that I know I want to play as portable games? Mm -hmm. uh, it will depend on how extensive like, the, uh, the Switch library is, because as we saw with the Wii U, there are some amazing games with the Wii U, but production kind of stopped, right? Like, we're, we're, we're tailing down, and that library is not necessarily big enough for me to justify, like, getting super excited about a transferred handheld. Right? Yeah. Um, so then there's this other question of, handheld's a weird place, right? You have to adapt a lot of things. What if the person's in a place where they can't have the sound on, right? What if they're in a bus and it's jarring them up and down all the time? There's a lot of things that can think about. How do you build a console game uh, that is also a killer console game and a killer uh, mobile game? And that, that is a question that is kind of, from a design perspective, a little bit hard to wrestle with. There are some that are, the reason I was excited about PC is because there are some PC games that incidentally I think would be really good at. Yeah. Right? That's one of the ideas. Undertale could be a good mobile. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of 4X strategy games or even hex based strategy games that you could play that you play with a finger, right? Um, that would be, that doesn't matter if you're bouncing all over, you don't really need to Kind of like Super Mario Bros. is a good example of what just came out. Like, it's, it's a really intense Mario. It's, Mario still, but you only need to use one finger to get through it. Now the question is, do you want to play Super Mario Run as a television game, as a console game? Yeah. No. Right, and so it's hard to find games that are bold, and that's what they're going to have to do for me to get really excited about the mobile versions. And, and there'll be great design space and challenges for designers yes. to make that, like you said, it's a challenge. Yeah, yeah I want to do that. Right. Yeah, I want to do that. I want to do it. Is there still enough utility in dedicated mobile gaming hardware, or, I mean, we all have phones. Right. I mean, is that close enough? I've got dedicated mobile games aren't there. So, I don't know, right? It might, the end of the thing is, is there IT. Um, and, but right now, there are actually more games that I want to consume than I can consume we consume already on this. And I can write extra credit checks over all on um, So, I don't know. I mean, DS sales have been dropping off a great deal. We saw what happened with the Vita. By the way, none of us, you've been in panels all day, none of us have eaten in... I go, cool. <laughs> 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 uh, don't get any pizza! <laughs> no, no, we're totally fine. <laughs> oh, 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 we ordered, no, we just ordered pizza for ourselves. Oh, okay. I would highly recommend for any of you guys who want to. Order pizza, bring it back to this room. Uh, we're gonna pizza, but you already took care. No, we we got it. Uh, so Matt is a producer, a television producer. <laughs> he he's got his hand on it. Solve. What happened? Nothing. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you all, but no, I think we will survive. We got ten minutes. All right, sure, sure. And then I'll get you. All right. So this is a completely different topic from what we uh what we're right. discussing. Um, but uh, basically, I've just been I've been slowly getting out of a depression in two years, and so I'm making new steps in my life. And uh, one step that I made was putting down seventy dollars and put it application to NYU's game design program. Because NYU, well, super great. I've seen their space. Their game design program's amazing. I love it so much. I'm not sure if I want to put down basically a total of $160,000 for two years of full-time like, graduates. <laughs> Have you considered any um, local junior community college options? Because I... Well, you're going for a graduate program. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, like... <laughs> So, you know, I've been kind of in the scene already in New York City, like, you know, the reason why I have this badge right now is because I've been, like, in the game dev community. Um, but, like, oh, hey, it's got, no, he's the reason why I have this badge. <laughs> also, check out Business, it's an awesome game. <laughs> um, but, um, so basically, I guess the question is, like, what should I think about, like, if I do get in, like, should I do it or should I not do it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 I'm just gonna give you advice even though I don't know you're Oh no, sir, so you started that sentence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're ending that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to do and 
what do you want to get out of that? So, I want to I want to design games that aren't just necessarily virtual games. Like basically, my portfolio consists of like analog games. Like one of them is like an outdoor game, which is crazy yeah. weird dodgeball with swords. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I, not just board game. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> just board game. No, no, no. It also, no, it doesn't have swords. But, um, <laughs> but uh, what I kind of want to get out of is more connection with people that are as passionate as I am, that are, are willing to put down 180,000 clams to like I mean, pursue it. If, if I may. I am in a unique opportunity where I see a lot of NYU students every day. <laughs> I work with NYU students who are in the Tisch program for uh, film. Uh, and I can tell you that they are a great group of people who will be poor for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they ask me, because uh, they, they themselves, even while there, are full of this doubt, because college programs like this, these are the times to join me with crippling self-doubt. <laughs> uh, these are also the times where you make connections with other people. I attended a film program myself after failing out of another school. And it was probably one of the best opportunities for me uh, to not only learn technique and practice in a safe space where I'm going to get constructive feedback, but I realized I became part of a system that could nurture the future as well. You are considering a unique opportunity, and I'm not saying it's good or bad, but you're considering a unique opportunity to not only experience something for yourself, but be in an alumnus position later on that will help also continue building a game community. And you know, it, it's this is kind of like laying this is a potential laying groundwork for a supportive environment that doesn't necessarily exist and one that exists inside of an academic intellectual environment where unfortunately the cost of it is very prohibitive for some people. And uh, that's a real concern because I can tell you from at least the film side, when you finish, you are rarely better off um, where you uh, financially where you where you started from. In fact you're often uh, you know less Better. What is that word? Worse. Worse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gooder. When <laughs> you work, but you have to you take a look at the program. See if the program is offering not only uh, not only uh, you know the kind of intellectual theory service, which I could just assume NYU probably will do an okay job. Um, but also <coughs> that, that practical knowledge and the more important community skill knowledge. To learn how to build teams, to learn what is necessary. These are the things that kind of come at added value and what really are for these programs. I know it's a long answer, and I wish I could tell you one way or the other, because I look at my experience and I'm like, eh, honestly, I could have probably not gone to college, jumped right into film, and I'd be maybe a year or two ahead of me, but at the same time, I wouldn't be nearly this handsome and charming. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so I would be the answer. If you're going to go to the university, I teach the university. I can tell you that the difference between an your graduate program, but generally it's true anyway. When you leave the high school world, it's the responsibility of the yes. teacher to take a seat. I went to teacher in elementary school, it's her job. It's like you walk into a college and it's worth it. So if you're going to go to a school because you believe that that school can offer you, list your top five. I will meet people, I will get to uh, be part of teams, I'll be able to finish projects, uh, I can intern for someone, right? If you're not doing those, it's going to be your fault, right? So I have two interns here helping me show a project. They're showing it here, They're, they took my class, and they are here because they want to experience it. That opportunity was open to everyone in my class. Two people said yes. So be the one that said yes, if you make that call. So the regret will be if you go to a school and you don't get out of it. You have to be aggressive about it. You're You're aggressive. Aggressive. Each and every single one of you. <laughs> <laughs> if I could say something, I, I have talked to college students and growing up, I actually had to live by folks in the state. I went to music school. I'm now a music teacher, I'm 50,000 in debt, um, but I lost my mom my sophomore year of college. 
I don't remember that entire year. I still graduated. To this day, I teach K-8, but I still feel like, am I actually good enough to do this? But the reward you get from doing something you love, and the work you put into doing that, it's going to make it worth it.
a bunch of game designers in the room. It's a weird convention where only game designers yeah. came together, and then like 1,500 people show up to play test for you. It's amazing. Here's another perspective, too, that may or may not apply to you, but it might apply to someone else in the room, is that if you go to graduate school for computer science or something that's more practical in the sciences and has, has value that is seen by the NSF. <laughs> um, All right, I will accept as value seen by the NSF. Right. <laughs> I got made 12 grand a year, that's not much to live on, but I got zero debt out of that. And that may be an option for some Something to consider, you can still study games, you can still study uh, like the you know, graphics, uh, even narrative, like the structure of narrative, art of intelligence, and generating narrative. So there are some options available there. Well, and I would say that also practical things, what we're looking to do is look experimental games. Come, feel free, join us in six. All uh, that. So, we can solve that problem. So, just on a practical side, if you are looking to make board games and some sort of uh, live action games and that sort of thing, one, go to Gen Con when you can. Um, I mean, it's on. It's, it's in Indianapolis, it's not super far. Uh, almost every board game publisher is going to be there. They're human beings, so don't worry about when they're involved in Well, I mean, you know. all right, so some of them are robots wearing human skin. Well, I knew it! <laughs> Oh, that's an interesting secret right there. Oh, that's a good secret. Oh, there are more of But, so Gen Con is a good place to meet swarming of people, and you only need to find one person to publish your game, and it's awesome. Uh, don't worry about the fact that half of them will have other projects. They probably will reject you because the game bad. They just can't do it like this. Uh, but the copy <coughs> being working in the industry is pretty cool. And then for your uh, sort of wilder live action field being the you have to indicate. There's really no reason not to yeah. um, because it's a great place for those sort of experiments to get those to meet people you can train and uh, they will And they'll give you a pass. Yeah. So, <laughs> submit to indicate because that's that's gonna be another really good thing. Alright, we got other questions. You're gonna start calling on people because I'm gonna start using the yeah. Okay. 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 All right. Uh, okay. My question. I saw your fighting game video where you had like talk about like fighting games, like how to get You had a lot of great ideas. I was saying, oh, you know, fighting games come a long way. They used to be. Oh, you're lucky that Matt just left because Matt was a huge fighting game person for the like, Mortal Kombat era. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, so your video was just more of a single single player experience, but like even with all the tutorials. In the, in the world, if you play against a computer, you only be as good at playing as a computer. So fighting games, they're kind of like, they require you to like go out and go and beat people and talk to mm people -hmm. and play with them. It goes back to like in Japan, arcades are big, kind of like America, arcades are big. <coughs> they go out every day and they go play. And they go play. Um, so, they yeah. go play game. And even in, the in, in America in the 90s, it was really big fighting games. Right? Yeah. We're not going to take a day to play them. And like, with today's resources, somebody wanted to get good. Besides playing the computer, they got like Shar you can. This is website you can get one. Go in there and get all the you want. You play Smash Bros. It's called Smash Bros. It's filled. If you want to pick any character you want in, in Smash Bros. and learn all everything that you know about them, it tells you. Um, with all that being said, should people you know do that instead of like playing a single player? Like you know, do like you know, look up stuff about how to get good with a certain character. Or go to Shar you can you're gonna learn how to like stop somebody who just when well, you knock them down with Shar you how do you beat the fighting game community has events and even though there's no arcades anymore, they often have things where everyone brings their stick. We're all gonna sit down and we're gonna throw down. Yeah. And you just need to be you just need to be aware of which events in your area exist and you get to them. Yeah, I mean, I, I do that, but I'm talking about from a casual perspective of like, in your video, you oh, say, I don't have to aren't going to exist without casual. Let's look at Street Fighter V and how it mm -hmm. sold without having any of the stuff that the casuals would want when yeah. it came out. It's a great game. Mm -hmm. It's probably one of the best fighting games to come out ever. So and if it were not for casuals, yeah. actually, that game 
in some ways almost died because it didn't have enough casuals. And while the fighting game community will always keep that game alive because Evo exists and CEO exists, in general, is Capcom going to keep that game alive if it sells the exact same way the next one they make? Or are they just it's, never going to make a new it's one? something yeah. fighting game developers, like as, as someone who doesn't design them, but is a player and is editorializing on the state of that industry, they're not doing a very good job making it easy for a casual to feel like their skills are progressing. And like Mortal Kombat, which somehow resurrected itself, has <laughs> a fairly well written story mode, but every chapter you're switching characters. And they don't tell you the basic moveset or fighting style, and I'm talking nine, right? Ten has the same problem actually, you switch characters super rapidly. And that's something I actually think is a design side failing because there are ways to make it easier for someone to get into a game without having to log onto an external website because that's an extra step. <coughs> Every time you impose an extra step on someone that's external to the process, some of the people will be like, screw this. I'm going to share a great story from a really, really smart person that, that I would tell you sitting right here. So I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> 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 One of, the, one of the things that's changing very quickly right now is artificial intelligence, which is my main research area, one of my company's main areas. And if you hear any, anyone here familiar with the shadow player from uh, Killer Instinct? The shadow yeah. player. The shadow yeah, yeah, player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so this is something called inverse reinforcement. Yeah, let me give you just, I'll give you a few minute uh, introduction of what's going, going on in AI in the last few years and how it's applied to games. Uh, so uh, let's look at uh, AlphaGo. Who here is familiar with AlphaGo? Some, some, folks, some folks are not. So AlphaGo is um, a, a Go player, the board game Go. It's, a, it's an AI. And computer scientists across the world, pretty much everyone in the discipline, thought it's going to be 20 years or more before computers beat humans in Go. It's such a hard problem. Well, they beat them this year, and not only did they beat them, recently they uh, it's won 50 of the, of the last 50 games against all the top players it's played against. And now humans are learning from the AI. And here's how it works. It's really just three algorithms that are all about, uh, they're all quite old. The first one is, is neural networks and, and deep learning. We've, we've just refined the algorithms over the years. We've been using this since the 1960s. And what we've done is we've just tweaked it a little bit and thrown a whole bunch of computing resources at it. What that does is it learns like, a, like, a, like a, an infant. It flails around a lot and, oh, I move this, this this way. If I send a signal down this arm, that's what moves us back and forth. It reduces the dimensionality, reduces the complexity of problems. So that's part one. Part two is something called reinforcement learning. Also has existed since the 1970s. And what this is, is it learns states of the world and conditions. So if I move my arm like this as an as a infant, I might knock this bottle over and that's milk in there. I want that, that's a good thing. And so there's an if-then conditional there. It learns that, but the problem with reinforcement learning is it doesn't know how to, how to gauge future payoffs. What is the value of that milk? I've got no idea. It's, and it takes a long time to learn that. It's always been a problem there. So what they did was they took neural networks, which are which take thousands, millions and millions of trials, shored up the weaknesses of the reinforcement learning, and used that to find the payoffs. So the neural networks take the board game of Go, reduce it down to the, uh, the, the simpler states, like the gestalt, the overall picture of the, of the game state. And then the reinforcement learning says, well, if you're in this state, then you want to move to this state, because this one's better. And then they use a third algorithm from the 1980s, 88, I believe, called Monte, Monte Carlo Tree Search. Which is uh, an algorithm is I think it's a hundred lines of code, or maybe a little more than that. Try things randomly, and then try where things have failed the least. That's it. And that algorithm performed pretty poorly for a long time. When you again throw a lot of computing resources or resources at it, it scales better than everything else. So now you have this conditional state, the state machine of all like I can move from this state to another. Now it randomly searches and it goes where it fails the least, and it can actually find and solve and be creative and find new solutions. Those three algorithms is all AlphaGo is. And uh, you put those things together, it, it operates more like, like an idiot savant 70 and it plays that well. Now, a couple other algorithms that have been coming out recently, one, the shadow player from Killer Instinct, uses something called inverse reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is, we know what, what is good, now how do we get there? Inverse re reinforcement learning is, we know how to get there, we just don't know what good is. Now, if you have a bunch of players, a bunch of pro, uh, you know, Street Fighter or whatever players, we know how to get there, we just don't know what good is. How do you define a goodness function for what the set of moves are that they should use? That's a really hard problem in AI. Well, inverse reinforcement learning, here's how it works. So you, you, you uh, play, you, you fight the dummy, you fight the shadow, it does nothing towards it. You just throw all your moves at it, great. Learn button, you hit the learn button. 
Now it, it saves your replay data, every, every input that you've made, and it measures the context around it, the distance you were to your adversary, whether they're throwing an uppercut, what, what special te technique they were throwing, how much time is left in the clock, how much help, all of these contexts in a medium dimensional database, about 50, 80 dimensions or so. And then it, it, all it does is it, it takes your replay stream, finds the current context, like what, where am I right now? Oh, here's a replay stream from you that looks like this. And then after the next time you play it, after you hit the learn button, it starts showing your moves back. Oh, well, you know, here's a good counter for this. And over a few hours, it can do quite well. All right, so now let's couple that, that basic algorithm with some of these other algorithms in AI that have been coming up recently. And I think if the, the fighting game, or the fighting uh, games producers and community can throw enough money at the AI, or can, even if they don't throw enough money, the AI is just moving that way, could really leverage this in another couple of years. Um, we can see AIs that can scale with you, that can learn from you, and actually teach you and advance the state of the art. I think something to that extent, however marginal or scalable, actually exists with, uh, of all things, the Amiibo. It's bad. Um, so, um, yeah. exactly. Now, the Amiibo is, is not quite there yet because the algorithm they use has a very small amount of memory. It's, it's sort of like a first step, I would say. It's going to take another couple, maybe another generation or two of Amiibos, and I think they'll be there. Yeah, you know, I was uh, my really smart friend gave an example I did not expect. Yeah. Well, I was expecting. <laughs> uh, you had a friend that made a game that uh, at every level got a little bit harder. Oh, right? yes, Grand Physics Deluxe. And I'm sure there's a few reasons about that too. But the, <laughs> the, the level of difficulty, the scaffolding for a new player, which is what you were sort of getting at, is like, how do you become better at it? What's the best way? And interesting that that scaffolding becomes too easy. So, so the Grand Physics Deluxe well, example. Um, you're familiar with like, a little, Yes, go for yeah. it. So, Cran Physics Deluxe is a... Who here is familiar with Cran Physics Deluxe? Cute little awesome little game I recommend. It's a game you just draw you, with crayons. You, well, not with real crayons, but you draw little crayon things to try to evolve towards a star. Nice little puzzle game. The guy who made it um, produced uh, a bunch of levels. And, you know, this game's about ready to, to go. Not quite. It's beta. He got 200 playtesters, randomly split them into two groups. And the first group of 100 he had to play the game and he measured how long does it take you to beat this level? How many times did you die trying? And a couple other measures about how difficult the level was and how, how, how long it did it. So I was like, okay, great. I'm pretty happy with the mechanics of this game, but actually he's really happy with the mechanics. He's not happy with the content. For the price point he was going to sell it for, he wanted about twice as much content, twice as many levels, twice as long to play the game. People beat it too fast. The easiest level was already too easy, he couldn't make time to The hardest level was already, he couldn't make it anything harder than that. So he very carefully made a level between each of the levels of difficulty between them. Doubled the number of levels, doubled the amount of content in this game. In the second group play, they beat the game in 40% of the time of the original. They beat it faster because they, they, they didn't have to jump that high, that the surprise was not there. Like, oh, I just take this and I do this. And he accelerated the learning rate. Shorten the number of hours of content yes. by doubling the number of actual content. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that value, like, uh, there's a challenge that it's going to get hard for me. What's interesting, though, is like, already seeing those mechanisms used in fighting games for AI against you, like in our game machine. Tekken does that, for example. They'll, it'll, it'll retain the frame data and the playstyle data of other players at that arcade. But they haven't turned that to tutorials yet, which I think is just for failing. Like, that's all it is just an oversight, because tutorials right now are great at telling you what you can do, how you do it, and not when, which is the core of moving from beginner to intermediate. I, I think yeah. a Guilty Gear Revelator uh, helps alleviate that issue, because the special mode is a bit more comprehensive, and right. it actually tells you when you evolve this one. I love that here. I love turning AI into how do people lose the most often, the most early, and let's teach them that harder in the, in the so I mean, as far as doing that, to, to me, it boils down to just going out and playing them. For example, if you're, if you're fighting against somebody, if, if I'm fighting against Zang Yi, I know to myself, he's a big wrestler. I should not go up to him. He's going to grab. Unless you're ready. Unless you're Armita. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but that just comes down to using your brain. And, yeah. you know, and, and a lot of people, like, as far as, like, a lot of the thing, if I wanted to be good at chess, I would read books about chess. Right. I wouldn't expect to play the game and not be using the chest. Like for a lot of yeah. Man players, it's really discouraging to have to lose 20 games in a row. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to lose more than you lose. So, let me ask you a practical question. Don't let Bosch stuff it. I'm terrible at fighting. 
Okay? And the reason why I'm terrible at fighting games is because the only person that I have ever played against is my little brother. He's three years younger than me. I'm 50 pounds heavier than Two feet tall. But he, he used to just wipe the floor. Because I have this crippling self doubt. <laughs> <laughs> crippling self doubt issue? Yeah, he's not a But I find it difficult to interact with strangers um, in fighting games because I feel that I can't perform at a level that the other player expects when I, I'm essentially wasting their time. And I feel that this is a hurdle that is hard for me to socially overcome. And I wonder if maybe there is something else besides the AI tutorial and learning ladder progression system that can allow me to engage socially with people, not just go back to playing with single player. You know, is that just gaming culture, though? So here's the thing. Um, I am a TO <laughs> from North Carolina. Um, I host a lot of um, fighting games. All right, um, the thing is, to kind of go to your, your, um, to your first question, does, um, and kind of why Street Fighter V failed, well, um, the, the single player is just for the casual. It's just a casual for the people to introduce, is to um, introduce themselves to said fighting game. Um, so, now, the job with the AI is to get the casual to the point where they want to become professional, or rather the semi-professional amateur. Yes. I, I have delusions of grandeur all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not pro, bro. Don't worry. So, so, that, so that part is saying, oh, hey, I can beat the hardest level of this AI. I can do it like quickly like this. All right, I want to go to the next step. I want to go. I want to go find where the people are at to try to fire them. And it's it's kind. Of, that's what the single player in arcade mode is trying to do. It's trying to build that honey trap for people to become, try to become competitive. Get a good trap. If you play online poker, you play online poker, right? They create a bunch of free poker sites that you can play on that you feel really good about your skills. <laughs> 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 And you get good, you get good poker by playing real people and by reading and talking with them. But I think, you know, I I play so not good poker, but um, it's very, very much an extreme form of that problem. The whole Go problem is lose your first 100 games as quickly as possible. I mean, learning Go is just brutal. You just get slapped around by people much better than you for months to years before you can even play. And I think the only thing that keeps people into it, uh, and most people it doesn't, most people quit. The only thing that keeps people is when they find something they like about what's going on that doesn't have to do with playing. They're like, wow, these stones are doing really cool, really neat things. Yes, they all turned white at the end, and I was supposed to be trying to keep that from happening. <laughs> but there's some sort of mathematical pattern in how they did that that I just find really intriguing, and I like watching yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm not like, I used to play a little bit of competitive game college and I don't because I'm not I can't hang anymore but the reason that I am still following the scene and into it isn't because I, I want to see you know who's gonna win the championship it's because I want to see the fucking awesome like, Falcon Punch at the end yeah. and the, the guy doing the really ah, yeah these fantastic style moves yes. that's you know those things <laughs> yeah just, just, just like cool. I know mean, these, these amazing okay. moments as, as a spectator and, and as both a casual and like a semi-confident player, like that's the stuff that is aspirational. I mean, I don't yeah. care if I win yeah. if I pull off that spike at the end. Of the, you know, like that's way more entertaining. Than so then, so then, would you say that competitive game, their fighting games need to make a bigger effort to have like put Evo in the face of casual players or some higher competitive level? No, no, it would be I mean, awesome. I mean, I mean, the opposite. They need to yeah. make it easier to do <laughs> things that are completely irrelevant to competition, but just really fun and like really entertaining to watch. Yeah, like, create, create a fantasy football version. Yeah. 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 Smash that GT is actually doing that. 
But for um for melee and smash four, basically um, for majors, it will actually and it actually for Street Fighter Street Fighter Five as well. It will actually have a fantasy. You can actually set up your own fantasy, meaning you ever gets the most points normally win a surprise. Like I think. Or what about most stylish KO? Yes, yeah, so that's. Yeah. See, yeah. I, 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 I won't watch the ladder too and go yeah. for that. I won't, yeah. watch the, I won't watch the ladder. Like I don't care who wins the tournament. I want. I want the highlight. Yeah, I want the. Yeah. You know. Yeah. 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 Y
Um, unexpected place, Battlefield, actually has really, really complicated ARGs uh, that you wouldn't even know exist because there's literally one dude uh, at DICE who his whole job is to create these incredibly elaborate puzzles. Um, just Google, um, that's great. It, it was like the, just Battlefield 4 camo or something. And there's like this crazy complicated ARG. And the, the he, you know, people have a, a stereotype of EA that they don't like do creative. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people like that. Yeah, but the, and the reason that EA does it and the reason that it's going to be more popular is it is unbelievably effective at it. Yeah. <laughs> people yeah. get into it, people tell their friends, it's, um, it's collaborative, it builds a community, everybody's kind of following it's right from. Uh, so I would not be surprised if in the next couple of years, ARGs become A, super common, and going to be really cynical. I think they're going to get oversaturated. Oh, yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised. That was the thing I was going to ask was, if, do you ever feel like it got, it, it, it's ever going to get to a point where they do, they are going to become more marketable, more. It's ever going to help them? Yeah. 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 I, mean, the problem, yeah the I guess that is true, yeah. And the problem is that you can like, too. Like, the, the appeal of these ARGs is the surprise and the feeling of getting one over on the developer and the developer trying to outsmart you and kind of, that, that's like an arms race that I don't see. I, 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 maybe, no, I mean, like I'm actually, no, I'm actually curious about Frog Fractions 2 because it's actually a very low test case in the fact that I'm not sure it wouldn't have just done better like having a small secret than coming out with, right? Um, yeah. uh, I, from a pure business corporate perspective, right, like, I'm not sure they didn't lose a lot of the hype from Frog Fractions 1. I'm not sure that a lot of the audience even knows that Five Nights at 2 is out. Right. Like, I mean, we got, we got some news about it, and you know, it, it was a Kickstarter, so I think mean, they may have a different business model in terms of how many people actually they need to play the game or whatever. But, um, but yeah, that's my cynical take: is that ARGs are going to get played out. They're going to either become too easy. Yeah. Uh, because they want, at, at developers, everybody wants to have an ARG and they want the media that comes with it, but not necessarily the people that's on the yeah. Or they're going to become so obscure and so hard that people are going to be like, I did two ARGs this month. You know, I'm not going to have another one. That was the one that we might have already done. And it will become less about community and more about the puzzles for you. Yeah. It will be generated based on where you live. Right. I, I have a school puzzle I have to solve, and it requires something from my own backyard. So it's right. so then I don't think from Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> it's just oh, oh, that's a huge yeah. yeah. That's terrible. The two of you. Have either of you guys played Perplexity? The old Perplexity? Oh my <laughs> god! You have to, if you can go to eBay and like get some starters, it is totally worth doing. Another dead CCG? Oh yeah. So, <laughs> I love CCGs. The first thing I ever worked in games was CCGs, and I have this vast library of dead CCGs that I would recommend to everybody. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, also, if I ever truly do something great in life, you know how a lot of people save champagne? You know what I'm talking about. I believe I have the last x of seen boxes of the Dune CCG. <laughs> So we're, we're going to uh, draft those as, as if I ever do something great, my way to celebrate is I'm going to get all my friends together, and we're going to do some draft out of this one. You got the items from boxes? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, kind of the same. But there was all of them. Yeah, Dune, 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 Dune was good. Dune was good. No, it was AG. Yeah. Uh, it was through la through the last Uber guys, but AG got the purchase that was the coast, so we worked on that product. The, the original rule is that it's not your Right, right, and, 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 and that's why I love it, right? Yeah. Because the only reason I love it is because those guys, I was at NorwestCon, and I actually got taught by those guys, otherwise I would never do that again. So by the way, it plays just like Dune. If you play like Dune, it's amazing, but you will never understand the game because it's the most complex CCG, and the rule book was... <laughs> right, that is the correct response. <laughs> Oh, oh, way yeah. worse way than that. Tap the oh, land for like, Spence your quantity. Okay. Describe how on earth is the temperature doing 
Uh, because there's like 17 ways to win. Okay. Right, and you can win by how many of them are games. It is possible to capture the spirit of Doom. Uh, yeah, the Doom board game is actually quite it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, so perplexity, jumping, popping back out of this nest in front of these uh, uh, So perplexity was an ARG, a puzzle ARG, um, built in CCG form. Um, and it had multiple layers of, of puzzle ARG in it because the each card was itself a puzzle or an ARG bit, and the back of it was an assemblable puzzle of all the cards or a, a meta puzzle, and all the things together, if you successfully solve everything and solve everything on the back, there's a way to from that a coordinate location in the beach $200,000 to spare. Uh, Someone on the bench you can get it two years after they went out of business. <laughs> After the company went out of business. Were they so the company for it or actually was dig up to $200,000. That's the most of the RH. How much time do you have to do with this one? Sure. Well, yeah. well, well, we're still on that topic of rules and CCGs. Have you ever heard of the game uh, Supernova? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, we, me and my brother picked up like a big box of like sealed cases of them at like a uh, at like an auction, yeah. and we're opening them. And if you've never heard of this game, um, the a rule book comes with every packet of cards. I'll get back to that in a second. Every, yeah, every pack of cards. Now, there are two cool things about two interesting things about this game. Um, every every player draws from like a shared deck. And uh, cards, you have like planets and like ships and stuff, and you like play planets and have like ships going around the planets and stuff. The second interesting thing is, despite being packed with uh, every every pack being packed with a rule book, the publishers didn't print an end game condition on the rule book. <laughs> and it's what? like, oh, you just stop when the deck runs out, and it's like, no, you just reshuffle the deck. <laughs> so we're kind of just kind of like, I would love to tell you that's the only game that's ever happened to you, but it's not. Insiders for tabletop are terrible rules writers for tabletop because we know how the game goes to be played. So like, you know, you do the stuff, you do the stuff, you do it. So then, I tell, I tell every beginning uh, tabletop hobby and CCG designer that playtesting your rules is as important as playtesting your game. And if you're interested in making tabletop games, honestly, go to your playtest group, hand them your rule book, and say nothing and see what game they play, because it will not be your game. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, eventually you hope to get close to your game, right? right. Uh, so, super important. Do you want to hop to another question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you with the blue hat. Yeah. yeah, so this was actually uh, inspired by the console conversation, but um, in relation to the future of consoles, or the future of PC, whatever, VR is this thing that's happening, and... Um, is it though? Again, it's trying That's a whole other discussion. That is a whole other discussion. Um, but I, you know, all, everything I've read about it though so far is like, okay, that's where you know we have the augmented reality of VR. That's where things are going. Maybe not as fast as people say they are, that sort of thing. Um, is that going to sort of take the place of consoles? Do you think? And also, maybe this is a question for over here. Um, there's still a huge problem with the discrepancies of how uh, women see the virtual reality stuff and how men do. So, like, if the future of gaming is VR, are we gonna get on top of that? The future yes. needs to be fixed. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's where it is. But, uh, can, can you explain what you mean about how men and women see VR? There's been a lot of studies that have happened that um, because women are shorter, those visuals of VR um, actually make people motion sick, or women motion sick, very, very often. Um, so it's a huge, so that's why like, when I hear, oh, the future's in VR, and I hear stories about women, you know, women in the family, well then, how am I going to have that video game? You're half of our people. I feel like there are things that they are meant to do that is if it's any consolation, I'm almost certain that the software fix for that is very quick to implement. Uh -huh. Other people will. I, that, I mean, I guess what, yeah, we've said a lot about this before, well, where it's like, oh, you should do this, and then it doesn't happen. So, well, there's the, uh, yeah. so I, I speak a little bit to this. So I did a little bit of like, kind of side work with the, the guys at Criterion who did the big uh, Battlefront PR mission. Um, and I can tell you that the like, number one design directive was nobody should throw up. 
to sell it to all of us. And I believe that to be the sequence of events yeah. that sort of led us to where we are now, which makes me sad because I, I'd like to see VR grow organically into what it could be, um, because the other side of it that uh, that I'm worried about is when I talk to a lot of consumers, probably not even in this room, but when I talk to a lot of consumers, the experience that they describe to me when I ask them to describe how they feel like VR is going to be is almost a holodeck experience, right? Where you can move around, you can walk around the room, where I'm going to be batting the ball with my hand or whatever. And, right, and right now, VR is actually just a marketing term for a head mounted display. We do not have virtual reality. We have a head mounted display that you can move your head. And it's, it's almost impossible. There's other errors, right? Like on the marketing side, well, you can't really express the VR experience through a video, right? Um, so there's all sorts of loose hurdles. So we set expectations way too high, we're way over hyped. We're not delivering on it. And now I've seen large entities start to, start to back away from the amount of commitment they had initially said they were going to give them. It'll never compete with traditional gaming. It, it's a gimmick. I mean, virtual boy. Look at that in the 90s. Everybody mm -hmm. hyped that. That'll be really good. That is virtual virtual. Virtual. There, Eventually, it's like a VR. Yeah. I mean, I mean yeah, that too. This is not the technology is not there to really push it to where it is. I mean, I know it's the same thing, but like the amount of design space it opens up, though, like it's seriously, cool. yeah, I mean, it's, it's super cool. cool. That's that's cool. cool. That's that's cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually I'm push well, back. Actually, yeah. I don't know. It's the porn industry is in on it. It will say. Every very big village is good in order to do it. Just because it's a gimmick now doesn't mean it can't be great later. Well, so the question is about that. I don't know if you know about the right information. Because if we crash the credits of the now, we may have a lot of leads here at the end. So I mean, I do let it be that sort of gimmick to the early adopters. Yeah, uh, people like me. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and where you basically, uh, by a space partition, sort of the same thing, where you wipe a lot of the things that are in our peripheral view. Um, I haven't seen, I haven't seen it implemented in a way that I felt like was super solid yet, but I'm excited for that. Have you tried the floor test yet? I haven't tried it. No, I haven't tried the floor test. It was pretty fun. Interesting. Interesting. So, so explain, do you want to explain this in case people don't know what this is? So the flow headset is a new headset coming out from Japan. Some lady who presumes last name, don't know her first name. So she uh, does eye tracking, so it renders only where you're, where you're looking at accurately. Everything else is rendering at 20% of the way lower. So, uh, by the way, you can do this like, and it's a weird thing to think about, but our visual cortex is actually super small. So the only thing that's really clear is the person I'm looking at right now. And if you actually like, try and look at your purple vision without <laughs> looking that direction, yeah. you'll see that the visual, the, the Anything in your peripheral vision, you got this massive drop off. Like by this time, I'm probably at like 20 percent render. By this time, uh, things are pretty blurry, right? So we don't actually have to make those look as good. So we can down res them on the fly in real time um, if you can track the person's eye. I said I hadn't seen it. But I haven't seen this little headset, so I'll have to see it. I'm, I'm really interested in it theoretically. Yeah, I'm working on my slides going for the next day. Mystics, guys, mystics. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, I do have a question. If you tackle free fall issue, you can count the main character to first person perspective. He drops off screen to the user because the scene's so simple. The, the user tends to look down and it draws the whole time point down and set for the point. Hmm. It's not a perfect system, but it works. If it blurs like the corner of the sides, our eyes do that naturally. So wouldn't that blur it even more? And then it would be hard to like. So if I'm playing a shooting game and I'm looking here and I see something run past me, I would have to look over there to see what it was because now it's double blurred. It doesn't blur right away. It doesn't 
Does it go yeah. down that way? It doesn't. It's like, has it's anyone right. seen this effect done? Does it affect it that much? Like, so if you hold your hand here, it's in your peripheral vision, but you yeah. have much more clear as an object. It, it is here, and you can see it much clearly than mm -hmm. an object that's over here that I'm not looking at right now. So when the entire VR headset is sitting right here, all of it is right here, and all of it is being processed by your brain at this rate, an object that's close to your face. Something that's far away, your, your brain doesn't have to work as hard. You ignore it. This software will take that thing, that, that ignoring, and does it really implement it for something that is physically right here. If you want to experience it today, what an approximation. Search on YouTube for a, a concept known as adaptive frameless rendering. It was invented around 2004, 2005. The idea is that you're pushing some number of pixels to the screen per second, or per, you know, per unit time. And how, where do you splat those pixels? If you have vertical sync enabled, you're splatting them all at once, you've got to wait until they're all there. And you, so one thing is you can do is you can reduce the resolution, and I can splat out more pixels per unit time. Adaptive frameless rendering says what in the scene is moving, and I'm going to splat my pixels there first, and then when the other parts that aren't moving as much, I'll splat them there later. So if you've got a bowl on a table, which is this particular example, if you move the bowl, the, the, the periphery is not moving much. Maybe it just moves a couple of pixels, so it's not going to update those quickly, but it'll update the bowl, and that's where your eyes are going to focus. The peripheral will update just uh, much slower. It break, this particular technique breaks down a little bit when you're doing full camera pan or full camera, you know, any, any broad movement. But if you're, if you're curious as to kind of what it looks like, adaptive frameless rendering. Furthermore, if you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it's not just that you get fall off because of you know, laws of optics and how much data you can get from you know, the and reflecting light. Your brain actually also just does work to make up what it thinks you should see the closer you get to the peripheral of your vision. So that's why like if you turn your head real quick and you kind of see that like fade like right at the peripheral there. You're, you don't actually see any of that. That's your brain coming up with stuff that it says, that should probably be there. So that's why stuff like that can also take advantage of that, because your brain's just going to fill in those gaps. It's not too good at detecting detail, but it detects motion. That's the primary purpose. So even if something is blurred, it's blurred anyway. As long as you see, a, see something moving, you're going to look over. Like in a first person shooter, if you have a super wide monitor in front of you, you're not actually looking at what's way over there. But you see that on the corner of your eyes, so you either glance at it, putting it in your field of view, or you move your mouse and look at it that way. And then one thing, I don't know, uh, that eye, uh, eye tracking technology is pretty awesome. In this one, but Wait, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Is there's a panel I think there was uh, the, there's a 10 o'clock. Oh, because you're just going out with the rest of the next book. Yeah. What's listed as the coming to skills? So I had to see how that works. Oh, my this. I believe that's Paul. I believe that's Paul. Oh, wait, I thought Paul was not in the room. Oh, Paul. Yeah, Paul was not in the room. No, no, no. Nothing was scheduled for this time. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. No, it's called, it's not scheduled for this time. Uh, uh, oh, it wasn't, it was like nothing. When I checked uh, back on the schedule, it was nothing was scheduled here. We're talking about that. Oh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're talking about. So who knows how he probably came to be? Oh! oh, 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 oh I can't oh, yeah. that. X-Men Do you know who can move in the game? Do you know whose fault it was? Oh, no. Why is it important for Mac? Why is it important for Mac? That goes back to the early days of Magnus when there was a team. Do nothing to do, right? Except for a little arcade. Um, and people play for music. And because there was nothing else to do, um, Stutter and Craig from Screw Attack was playing Colossus. And they were bored, intentionally muted, and very tired. And every time he would use that super move, he would vocalize it for the whole room. And the room was probably no bigger than this one, right? Um, so soon people started to. Join him and come back. And I can tag that tradition as well. Here, we have now talked about how it matters.